Hi folks, Eric from Hit Subscribe here, and uh, I am doing yet another edition of the freelancer Q&A that I've been doing on this channel for a few years. Um, I'm looking at my lighting. I just got like a new light overhead, but like, I don't know if overhead and slightly behind me is the best place for lighting. Uh, but hopefully this works out, you know, uh, we'll see. Uh, it looks, I have a very small view of myself here and it looks a little interesting, but you know, uh, I'll let you all be the judge of that. Anyway, um, this week's question is fairly straightforward and it's a topic that like, I'm thinking I might've covered at least obliquely before, but after two or three years, I've done like 70 of these now, I forget how many, but it's a lot. So, um, as I work my way through my backlog and or field new questions, there is always the potential for a little bit of overlap. So if I've covered this before, I'm sorry, but if I have, it's probably so long ago, I don't remember it, you know? And so that's basically the same as I've never covered it before. Anyway, preamble out of the way, um, <clears throat> pardon me. The question really boils down to uh, how to start consulting. So um, this one is short enough and I'm getting well enough organized with these after all these years to finally actually like have the context here in front of me. So I'm just gonna read you the question. It's about a paragraph and I think the context from reading it will be more helpful than me summarizing it. Um, the question asker says, I'm currently in an interesting career situation. I recently left a startup I helped found and I'm considering starting another one, but that's going to take time. I'm fortunately financially stable, so I was considering, quote, consulting, and that's how I came across your blog, mostly to offer value and improve my network while I determine the next steps. Do you have any advice on this? Is it easier to find consulting opportunities while you're already employed, or is it mostly about presentation of your value and ultimately delivering on it? So that's the question. Again, to summarize, because there are a couple of parentheticals in there, um, uh, uh, help found a startup, left that startup, is financially fine, planning on doing another startup, but wants to bridge the gap with some consulting. Um, and what's my advice on this? And by the way, uh, if you're watching this, the person that asked this question, I mean, this was asked like two years ago, so probably you're at that next startup. I hope you're doing great. But for the rest of the audience, um, let's dive into this. So before I go any further, and this one I know I've done a video on, um, it's important to define consulting here. And I'm not sure if the person asking this question, I don't have the context, um, is talking about true consulting or doing what I'll call contracting, which is essentially like service-based labor. So just to recap, and those of you that watch these videos regularly, I've talked about this a lot, but consulting and just doing work for someone who isn't your employer are not the same thing. Consulting is a narrow band of work that means um, somebody is paying you to give them advice. You're not delivering code or graphics or blog posts or whatever. Um, you are instead being called in and somebody is paying you to tell them what to do. That is consulting. And the reason I'm drawing this distinction is precision matters here. So if you're, you know, a lot of the audience is going to be freelance uh, software engineer types of folks, a lot of people will um, be fuzzy about this and say, I'm quitting my job as a software engineer and I'm going to be a consultant. And what they're really talking about is contracting or freelance software development, which is not consulting. If somebody hires you to go write a bunch of code and, you know, work on their website or work on some, you know, video game or whatever as labor, uh, you are not a consultant. You are a contractor uh, or a freelancer. And um, the reason I'm harping on this is because the question here is specifically about consulting and it's coming from somebody who would be in a position to consult um, more easily than somebody who had been doing labor their whole career. So I think that getting this right matters for the sake of discussion here, because I'm assuming that we're not talking about um, I'm looking to do like Upwork contract gigs here or something. So I wanted to mention that distinction as germane to the to the question and my response, because for the rest of the post, I'm going to assume that what's being asked here is how with this set of circumstances do I go about uh, doing work where I'm paid to give advice? <clears throat> so um, the first thing I'll say is, is uh, I'm gonna talk about specific responses to this question and then generalize for the audience a little bit here. So the first question, sub question here was, is it easier to um, do consulting when you're already employed or when you're independent and not employed? And I would say pretty unambiguously, it's gonna be easier for you to do real consulting when you are not employed. And the reason I say that is the only 
<clears throat> kind of salaried role that I think might complement or lend itself well to moonlighting as a consultant would be if you were an executive. So for instance, um, I, uh, well, this isn't a great example. I am an employee of my own business and I also do fractional consulting under the umbrella of hit subscribe. For instance, like literally actually later today, I'm going to be on a call with a fractional CMO type of engagement. This is a little bit of an awkward circumstance because the consulting is actually part of my business is deliverable, but it sort of illustrates the point that if you are an executive in an executive role and you have that kind of career autonomy, and you are typically engaged in your own organization in a purely strategic role, so C-suite executives are not doing anything that would really be construed as labor, that might um, dial up consulting fairly well. So what I mean is if the, you, the question asker, uh, between startups decides to take on a role for a year as a chief operating officer or something like that, that is the kind of role where you could credibly, um, if you were having a conversation with the right type of person, uh, say, you know, hey, I'll do a kind of moonlighting, you know, nights and weekends because I'm pretty busy. But if you want to pay me a retainer of a few thousand dollars a month, you know, you can call me for advice about whatever anytime. So if you are in a salaried role that is executive in nature, then maybe that could be compatible with consulting. Otherwise, if you're thinking of taking a job, you know, I, I don't remember what the person's background here is, but if you're thinking of taking a job doing like app dev or SEO or something, uh, no, I wouldn't take a labor job and then try to consult in your spare time. Um, it's just kind of unlike, like it, um, nobody who wants truly consultative advice is going to um, find somebody who's a senior software engineer and be like, hey, I want to pay you to tell me what to do. Um, the kind of person that can sign a check for true consulting, usually, unless you're talking about really, really small gigs, usually that person is going to be an executive and why would they, um, need some other company's software engineer to tell them what to do when they've got a bunch of their own software engineers in their organization that they could ask for advice. So anyway, um, I don't want to belabor the point, but I would say that um, trying to moonlight as a salaried employee, trying to moonlight as a consultant is not going to go super well. So I would be off on your own. And there's also kind of, I don't know, optics reasons behind this. So what we're talking about here, what you have cited, the question asker in this post is um, that you had uh, the kind of exit from a startup that left you fairly financially stable. There's a lot of cachet to that. So you have been involved in founding a startup where you had some kind of liquidity or exit event that left you fairly well off. Don't go and like get some job working for somebody else. Uh, to try to further your consulting experience, like you're probably in a good position. There's probably people that want your advice um, just with that cachet alone. Uh, there is something to be said for consulting where you are legitimately telling people, I don't really need the business, but it is um, interesting and fun for me to come in and do projects like this. Um, that frankly, if I were to hire a CEO for hit subscribe would be my situation. Like I probably wouldn't really need to, um, do work at least for the foreseeable future in order to be financially okay. So the idea of like, I find consulting great. I kind of miss my management consulting days. So in that situation, it would be appealing for me to just come in and, you know, take a look at what an organization was doing and figure out, you know, maybe I can help here. So I would definitely not uh, take a full-time job unless maybe it's as a C-suite executive, but in that case, you probably got your hands full and plenty to do there. So I would set aside um, the idea of being a, a salaried worker in this position. And actually more generally, um, I think you'd be a lot better off uh, purely on your own if you're going to try to become a true consultant. So um, in terms of, you, you know, setting that aside, how would somebody in this situation go about starting to consult? Um, I would ask myself the question, what advice might people pay me for? Or what advice would I be, how do I phrase this? Not just what advice might people pay me for, but what advice should people pay me for? Um, and the distinction I'm drawing there is kind of anyone can give advice about anything, but you as a consultant have to start um, understanding when it might be malpractice to ask you for advice. So the the thing you're asking is, when would there probably be a return on investment to somebody paying me for advice? 
So for instance, if you have um, successfully founded a startup uh, that I'm assuming, I'm inferring from this was maybe a um, venture back startup, but you understand the process of maybe going through a startup incubator. Maybe you understand the process of raising a seed round or an A round. Um, you have been in the trenches doing that. Now, if you're talking about um, other startups out there, there are probably people that would pay you as prospective startup founders potentially to understand what it takes to raise a round of funding or other aspects of your experience as a startup founder. So to start to think about, okay, um, I could give advice about how to go about raising a seed round or an A round. And then should I, like, should somebody pay for that? Well, certainly I would think so if they're going to go and raise, you know, millions of dollars in funding and your advice is going to help with that, there will almost certainly be a return on that investment. So in this specific situation, that's the kind of thing that I would start brainstorming is, you know, what is your experience and who might pay to have access to that and to have your advice about what to do in their situation. So startup founder, you know, it's going to be raising funding. It's going to be making early hires. It's going to be, you know, maybe in uh, decisions about when to DIY versus when to pay someone in the early going, or maybe on the back end, it's, you know, you were, um, a founder and you exited in some way, how did you negotiate uh, terms and equity on the way out, that type of thing. So um, there's probably a lot of ground to cover there. But for the rest of the video, just for the sake of making this interesting to um, other folks, let me get a little bit more generic about this because um, one tire, like, you know, single uh, time founder and prospective uh, multi-founder is a relatively uncommon situation. So I do want to generalize a little bit here. Um, for anybody that might be looking at the question of how do I get into consulting. Um, Jonathan Stark, who does the Ditching Hourly podcast and, um, you know, I would think of as a pricing coach. I'm not sure exactly what he's up to these days um, in terms of how he would position this, but I do know that he has cohorts that learn about uh, pricing and different pricing models and so on. Anyway, uh, Jonathan Stark, uh, Ditching Hourly Podcast and JonathanStark.com. Go check him out by all means. He gives a piece of advice that I really like, and I'm kind of paraphrasing from memory, but it's basically you should make this switch um, from I do X to I know how to do X. And I'm giving this advice because I think a lot of you watching are quite likely um, people who have made a living doing knowledge work. So a lot of software engineers, but maybe freelance writers, um, freelance marketers of some kind, um, graphic designers, uh, but people who do knowledge work, um, but labor knowledge work. This is really good advice. So what he's getting at here and what I'm channeling to give you this advice is let's take one of these situations. So you're a software engineer. What do you do? Well, I'm a .NET based web developer. So that's I am X, I, I do this. But if you start to pull back and think about um, what do you know how to do, now you start to flip a switch and get into the world of consulting. So you are a .NET web developer, you um, build websites with .NET. You also know how to build websites with .NET. Now this is a little flimsy to start with because probably the only people that are gonna pay for advice, let's call it on how to build websites with .NET, are aspiring .NET web developers, meaning at this point, if you're just um, going along with my train here of thought, you are teeing up, you know, I guess selling info products to aspiring .NET developers, which isn't consulting and is a pretty uh, race to the bottomy business these days. But if you start to think about um, who your buyers might be um, and what you know how to do, well, I'm guessing if you are a senior .NET web developer, you probably know at least something about how to hire and screen .NET web developers. You might know how to mentor them. You might also know what makes them happy or unhappy. So, you know, start brainstorming the kind of things you know. And I'm putting it this way because, for instance, let's pull on the thread of you know what makes them happy or unhappy. If you had um, the ear of a um, dev manager for a .NET shop and you had deep insight and a lot of experience of knowing how to make .NET developers happy, there is a world where you might consult on how to improve the morale of .NET teams 
working in legacy code bases, for instance. Now you would have to build up some chops about that and I'll get to that here in a moment. But this is kind of what we're talking about is you know things that other people would be interested in knowing. If you know how to hire .NET developers, uh, there are probably recruiters that would be interested in that. If you know how to um, evaluate the quality of .NET developer code, um, you might come into organizations that are looking to have a project done, but have no internal knowledge of how to um, qualify whether a programmer or a vendor was any good. Meaning if you know a lot about how to look at .NET code and say whether somebody's any good at it or not, you could go along for the ride with a company that was looking to hire a freelancer or two to do some work and say like, look, I don't actually want this work, but if you need somebody to help make sure that you don't hire somebody who's completely incompetent, I can do a brief consulting uh, engagement with you for the period of time during which you're doing this uh, request for proposals, RFP, and I will help you screen and qualify these candidates. So that's the kind of thing that you can start to think about as you shift from what do I do, I write .NET code to what do I know how to do, well, I know how to say whether .NET code and programmers are any good or not. I know how to hire them. I know what makes them happy, et cetera. So um, that is, I think, a good way to start the creative juices flowing about how you might consult. But um, I think that making that jump is going to prove challenging um, for a lot of folks out there because there is this idea that um, there's – in the beginning kind of zero barriers to entry to what you're doing. So here's what I mean. Like this sounded like a great thing, right? Like you get a consulting gig to come in with a company that's trying to hire like three other .NET developers and say, look, I have no skin in the game because I don't want your coding job. Um, and I will uh, help you determine whether any of these other .NET developers are any good. The problem there is each one of those .NET developers could also make that claim like, well, no, I mean, what does this idiot consultant you have here know about hiring .NET developers? I'm also a .NET developer. Why don't I come on and help you judge these other two people? So um, you need at least some plausible narrative to separate you from that. And in the beginning, if all you've ever done is labor, you don't really have that unless you were doing something fairly specialized at your day job. Um, so anyway, to kind of level set a little bit with this, what I would do out of the gate if I were you is tee up um, for the sake of jumping from labor to consulting, tee up a bunch of market research calls and do a listening tour. This is another piece of advice that I give very, very frequently for people that want to get into consulting or uh, indie hood or productized services. So tee up that listening tour because you're probably not going to right out of the gate with no experience, be able to convince someone to pay you 250 bucks an hour or whatever to like evaluate their RFP candidates. But what you can do is start to have calls with people that might be in a position or might want that. And to kind of specify like, listen, I'm thinking of doing this. Can I pick your brain? Now, what this is going to do, number one, is potentially validate what you're thinking of doing. So if you start to, you know, work within your network or people, um, uh, that are adjacent to your network, let's say, and you're getting on calls with them, you know, would you pay someone to help you run an RFP among freelance programmers? So you target people that don't have any in-house knowledge of this and maybe don't have a lot of experience managing a freelance programmer and you start to pick their brain. Like, would you hire someone to do this? Cause I'm thinking of doing this. What, uh, you know, what would help you make that decision? What would cause you to trust somebody? So those are good conversations you you can have to either validate the consulting niche or, you know, maybe everybody's telling you, no, I wouldn't pay for that. Um, but it, the conversation wouldn't just stop at no. They would probably start to say, but, you know, I tell you what I would pay for or what I, you know, do value or whatever. So you can start to learn and adapt and think about the offering. But it also gives you a pretty reasonable and gentle sell where you could say, listen, what do you think about you're going to run an RFP and you're telling me you'd be pretty on the fence about paying someone to um, uh, to help you screen these vendors. What if I did this for you for free? And my motivation here is it's one thing for me to hypothesize about doing this, but I would like to live it. I would kind of like to see what it's like. And I'm not really interested in doing the uh, freelance.net work for you. And I'm not sure whether this is um, a good offering or not, or whether I could really fulfill this or not. Like there's a lot of unknowns here. I think until I just got into the mix and helped with this, 
it would be pretty hard for me to price it or know about all the particulars of it. I think people would generally be pretty receptive to this because now you have somebody who's experienced. They don't really have a horse in the race and they're not charging. So if you're that person that's looking to hire a freelance programmer, I mean, kind of why not? Now, once you do one or two of these, maybe for free or a heavy discount or something, um, you know, give me a testimonial if you like it or, you know, pay if you're satisfied. Once you do a few of those, now you have created the barrier to entry. So unlike any random programmer that's going to come into the world and say, you should pay me to give you advice about other programmers, you've done a couple of engagements like this that you can point to and say, you know, I did this. You can talk to Steve over here that I worked with and he thought it went pretty well. And that is minimal um, a step up as it may seem is a huge step up for most buyers because they're interested in social proof. So the second that they can see somebody else trusted you to do this, they're much more inclined to uh, trust you, even if it's only like one or two people in the past. And even if you're fully transparent about like, you know, a month ago, I was just writing code and I did a couple of these, they seem to go well, you know, now they're probably willing to pay you to do that. Um, so that barrier to entry that seems kind of low is actually surprisingly high and doubly so considering that most people that are used to doing hourly labor type things would absolutely never offer up any kind of fee anything. So the, um, the bigger barrier there is that most people are hyper optimized and indeed might consider themselves suckers if they ever spent a minute of their time uncompensated. So the fact that you're willing to absorb the risk and absorb the learning um, and kind of bridge that gap to a potential offering is going to put you out in front of like 80% of people just because most people won't do that. So um, that's kind of the sum total of my advice here about how to get into consulting. In the specifics of this situation, I would definitely draw heavily on the unique experience in the startup world. But for somebody in general that may not have that experience and indeed may not right off the cuff have um, the kind of experience that people would immediately pay you for your advice, I think you can start to brainstorm a pretty long list of what advice might people pay you for. And then you can start to frame that up, do market research around it, and maybe do a couple trials on giving that advice. And once you've done that, you're going to be um, pretty well positioned to at least hang out your shingle, put up a landing page, and start with the consulting practice and start trying to win actual uh, paid profitable business for it. So um, I hope all of that is helpful for some of you out there and that um, if you are you know, interested in consulting, um, that this nudges you along the path a little bit. Uh, if you have questions, like especially around consulting, I'm always happy to um, answer those. So if you're watching this on YouTube, feel free to comment. Or uh, if you're in touch with me through any channels, feel free to you know, drop further questions in here. So uh, hopefully that is helpful for some of you and I will catch you next time.